Show me your face without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Do you believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word that you have given to us that explains to us where we come from, everything is Here is a verse from chapter 13 of Job, verse 15, chapter 13. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my way <coughs> in his face. Psalm 42, 5 says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. <clears throat> the 31st verse of Isaiah chapter 40 reads, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope <coughs> fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Shall we stand, and if you want, turn in your hymnal to number 306. <coughs> we will do all four verses, number 306. My hope is built in the lands. Yeah. 
number 42 in the green chorus book, if you want to hear it. In Christ alone, through all the verses. Well, this is the second. This is the second Sunday of the month, and I know some of you will be a part of the CE meeting today. But usually on the second Sunday of the month, some of you have all uh, have been going to the Crooked Creek Cafe in Little Marsh, and uh, so that brunch time is still available if the preacher doesn't preach till twelve o'clock. But it's. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. so f feel free to join one another at Crooked Creek Cafe up 249 in Little Marsh. They do usually, I think, have a Sunday brunch, but she stays open and uh, has extra food because uh, we've been meeting there that's this second Sunday.
How many of you, how many of you had a kaleidoscope when you were a child? Still have one. Still have one. We do. Yeah, you want to go get it? No, not now. <laughs> I, I didn't know we still had one. Well, you know, a kaleidoscope is, is that toy, or it consists, it consists, it's a tube containing mirrors and pieces of colored glass or paper, and the reflections produce changing patterns that are visible through the eye hole in the tube, and you rotate it, and you know it changes all those patterns and changes all those things. I actually looked up online and thought about downloading a video that showed like a kaleidoscope pattern that you could see on the screen, you know, how it changes pattern. But I thought, if that stays up there while I'm preaching, everybody's going to start looking like, you know, they've been hypnotized or something. <laughs> so like, no, don't think I want to put that up there. But where we're at in our study of Psalm 119, uh, verses 161 to 168, is really, when you look at it, it's, it's like a kaleidoscope. The unifying theme is the law of God. And the kaleidoscope is the riches of God's revelation that really result from the awe of God's word. So as we look at Psalm 119 this morning, I don't want you to hold your Bible up and try to twist it, but think of it as if you are looking through a kaleidoscope and as we unpack it, the different patterns of the riches of God that's revealed through his word becomes evident. So you got that in your mind? Well, let's look. Psalm 119, beginning in verse 161. Rulers persecute me without cause, but my heart trembles at your word. I rejoice in your promise like one who finds good spoil. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your, word, your law. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous laws. Great peace have, those, have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. I wait for your salvation, O Lord, and I follow your commands. I obey your statutes, for I love them greatly. I obey your precepts and your statutes, for all my ways are known to you. The dominant color in this kaleidoscope of the sin or, and, and shin stanza. And to explain that, the stanza alternates between the two words in the Hebrew alphabet. Sin in verses 161 and 162, and it's not the word sin like we think of sin. It's a Hebrew word reflecting the alphabet. The shin is in verses 163, 164, and 165, and then the word sin again is used in 166. So it's different. And shin again is used in 167 and 168. So it's different. All the other ones had one word reflecting that, that part of the Hebrew alphabet that would start each verse. This one uses two. But the dominant color is really found in verse 161, and it's in the phrase, the second part of that verse, where he says, my heart trembles at your word. The King James Version says, my heart stands in awe of your word. And so I want us this morning to consider the kaleidoscope of God's riches, but it begins in verse 161 with the premise of the psalmist. In other words, in 161 is the premise from which everything else, you know, in a kaleidoscope, usually there's one dominant color. And there are different shapes, different, different patterns. And the premise of the psalmist in 161 is that his heart trembles at God's word. I believe a lack of respect for God and a lack of respect for his word 
is one of the biggest problems in our world today. But it's really always been a problem ever since Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden because Adam sinned because he didn't respect and didn't stand and tremble at the word of God. Even those who say they have some measure of respect for God many times don't have enough of that respect for it to make a difference in their lives. Others honor the word of God by living in such a way to show respect and awe that they have for God and his word. The prophet Isaiah says, that God will esteem he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. The contrite in spirit that is mentioned by Isaiah is the key that really unlocks the meaning of what Isaiah means by the word tremble in the next phrase. Just to be afraid of God or his word is not enough. To tremble at God's word is to be so affected by God's word that it brings us to that place of repentance, of, be, of humility and contrition before God. We live in a day and age where Christianity likes to affirm the love of God, and, and that's true. God loves us. We live in a day and age where we gather together to worship and we want worship to be exciting and stimulating and uplifting, which worship should be. But understand that the scripture tells us that we are to tremble before God. There are examples in the Bible that show that trembling alone is not enough, though. The scripture that Mike read to begin the service from the book of James in the New Testament says, You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Belief in God or in Jesus Christ is sometimes enough to cause one to tremble. When you come face to face with the truth about God as he is revealed in his word, you ought to expect to experience fear and trembling. James uses the demons here as an example of this very point. They believe in Jesus Christ. They know he is truly the son of God. In Mark chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, the Bible says, For he healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. They believed and fell down before him, caused the people that they possessed to fall down before him. I believe the fear of God and his word is a healthy thing. Fear in the sense of esteem and respect and honor, we venerate the word of God. We worship God and his word above all else. The wise man that wrote Ecclesiastes says that man is to fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing whether it is good or evil. So we need to recognize our accountability before God and also have an understanding of the fear of the Lord. Right after mentioning man's accountability before God in 2 Corinthians 5.10, the Apostle Paul says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. If we are to serve God acceptably, we will do so with reverence and godly fear because our God is a consuming fire. Our accountability to God and an understanding of the fear of the Lord are two things that have caused many people to walk in humility and holiness before God. And those are things that are severely lacking 
among Christians today. Understanding our accountability to God and understanding the fear of the Lord. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus told his disciples, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The fear of the Lord. Don't be afraid of other people. They can't touch your soul. But you need to be afraid of the Lord. Now think about it. Why wouldn't someone who understands the inspiration and the authority of God that is behind this written word be struck with fear and trembling at the reading or the preaching of that word? If you really believe this is the inspired and infallible and authoritative word of God, we ought to approach it as we approach God with fear and trembling. If this word is the power of God unto salvation, if this word is sharper than any two-edged sword, if this word will not return unto God void, but will accomplish all that it is sent forth to accomplish, if this word will someday judge us, should we not be struck with fear and trembling when we read it or hear it preached to us? You see, if you don't have that kind of approach, to God's word, you'll never, in the kaleidoscope, see the pattern of the riches of God's revelation. That's the premise. That's where it all starts. But then he goes through and outlines some of the riches. Because he trembles at God's word, he's able then to describe for us really the kaleidoscope of God's, the riches of God's revelation. And so if you want to see the different patterns, you want to see the richness of a kaleidoscope, you've got to turn the tube. And so he's turning the tube. In verses 161 and 164, it's praise. You see the pattern of praise that becomes evident. The psalmist is so captivated by the truth of God's word that he repeatedly finds himself praising God for it. True praise is inspired by the word of God. They started, we started our service this morning with scripture reading. Before we started worshiping God through music, scripture was read. True praise is inspired by the word of God because it is through the word of God that the riches of God and his revelation is given. The best songs that we have in the church are songs that have a foundation in the word of God. We have a whole book of the Bible called Psalms that I'm preaching from. You know what that is? That's a hymn book. And I'm not saying that hymn books are inspired by God because you go through some of the songs in the hymn book. There's a lot of garbage in there. <laughs> a lot of songs in the hymn book that aren't scripturally supported. But especially as new music comes on the scene, understand. Praise. The foundation for praise comes from God's word. But he makes it this way, if it came to a choice between the wealth of the world and the word of the living God, it would be the Bible for him. Because he says, I rejoice in your promise like one who finds great spoil. 
if we put it in our vernacular, he says, I rejoice more in your word of God than, is it, than I would if I won the lottery. So do you rejoice at God's word as one who finds great spoil? Do you count yourself blessed by God? Because you have a Bible. You have a Bible? You ought to rejoice. You have a Bible in your own language that you can read. And not only a Bible in your own language that you can read, but you have different translations that allow you to read at whatever level of comprehension that you have. And you can get a Bible almost anywhere. I think they even sell Bibles at Dollar General. All you have to do is go overseas and you realize you are blessed. And that ought to lead us to praise. The next turn of the kaleidoscope, first one is praise. The next one, you turn it again, the next one is peace. Look at verse 165. Great peace have, those, have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. So a second time. This is the second time he speaks of love for the law. That's in 163 and here 165. But it brings with it a sense of great peace. Through the word of God, you learn of the reconciling power of the cross that provides peace with God. It is through faith cometh by hearing and hearing by what? Come on, wake up. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. It's through the word of God that you understand the reconciling power of the cross that Jesus died for your sin according to the scripture, was buried and rose again, Paul says in Corinthians, according to the scripture. And so when you believe in him, and receive him as your Lord and Savior because he died for your sin on the cross and was buried and rose again, conquering sin, conquering death. He now offers you eternal life to those who believe in him. And when you believe in him, you have peace with God. It's through the word of God you understand that peace with God. It's through the word of God that you understand and learn the comforting power of the Holy Spirit. Through the word of God, you discover the ability to stand before the heavenly father and you stand before him as a person that is loved and forgiven and accepted and secure and significant. But if, you're, if you don't love the word of God, if, the word, if you do not approach the word of God with fear and trembling and as you open it, allow the word of God through the spirit of God to speak to you and reveal the riches of all that Jesus has done for you, you will never know those things. You will never have that kind of peace if the word of God is not a part of your life. The Lord, the Bible says, gives great peace, a peace that transcends all understanding, a peace that transcends all understanding, and what is it going to do? It's going to guard your hearts and minds. Those who love God's word are protected, he says here, against the fiery darts of Satan because he says they won't stumble. Nothing can make them stumble. Isn't that interesting? Nothing can make them stumble. Their feet are guided so that they will not stumble. Their hearts are guarded so they will not stumble. So again, he takes the kaleidoscope and he turns it again. He saw, first of all, what? Say it again. Praise. Praise. He turned it and he saw what? Peace. Peace. Well, he turns it again. 
Look at verse 166. There's patience. Patience. He says, I wait. Could be translated hope. The word simply means a long and patient waiting. All David's hope was fixed on was God. He looked to God alone for salvation. The salvation that we receive in this life through Jesus Christ is full and complete. When you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are forgiven of your sins. Your salvation is full and complete in Christ. There's nothing you can add to it. There's nothing more that needs to be done. When Jesus said it is finished on the cross, it was finished. And when you trust in him, you are saved by grace through faith. And it's done. But the realization of that is in the process. <clears throat> and so he's waiting, he says, for salvation. Of course, of the salvation that David would look for as the psalmist would be the fulfillment of all of God's plan of redemption in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who were saints in the Old Testament were saved by faith, just like we are, but it was faith in the future work of Christ. And so he's waiting for Christ to come. We can look back on the cross and realize that when we come to him by faith, we are saved, we are redeemed, we are transformed. But in a real sense, we are still waiting, aren't we? Because he ascended into heaven. And Jesus said, I will come again. The angels told the disciples who saw him ascend into heaven, standing there watching him go into heaven with their mouth wide open going. They said, why are you standing here looking into heaven? This same Jesus, whom you saw go into heaven, will come again. In the clouds. And so we are waiting. But that takes patience. You can never be more saved than you already are, but the fullness and riches of our salvation requires a long and patient waiting. The waiting of salvation is always the side that has to do with the future. The fullness of our salvation will be realized when Jesus Christ comes again and takes us to be with him. The Bible says that we will be changed. We will be transformed. We will be like him. I'm still waiting. There are two things to be done while we wait for the return of Jesus Christ. The first is to hope in God. The second is to follow his commands. I wait for your salvation, O Lord, and I follow your commands. Now, the first without the second would be presumption. The second without the first would be legalism. God's word gives us the ability to wait patiently. That comes in our salvation. Because he trembles at God's word. Because he has turned the kaleidoscope. And he's begun to see the, the riches of God's revelation. Understand, this is not all of the riches of God's revelation. This is just what he's recorded in this stanza in this little kaleidoscope that he's looking into. But he finishes the stanza by giving really, I have it number five on your outline of the back of the bulletin, a proclamation. He proclaims in verses 167 and 168, he proclaims his obedience, both to the precepts and the statutes of the word of God. His obedience is both to the practical and doctrinal parts of God's word. He says, I love your precepts and statutes. I obey your precepts and statutes. I obey your statutes. That's the doctrinal and the practical parts of God's word. And why does he obey? In his proclamation, he says, I obey. Why? 
because I love them greatly. Also be translated exceedingly. It's not like he's saying, I, I, I love your word. He's like, no, I really love your word. I love it greatly. The psalmist knows that all is, the psalmist knows that it's difficult to do something when you don't like to do it, right? It's easier to do something when you love to do it. You know why most people like me that need to lose weight don't exercise? I don't like doing it. Now, there are people that really love to exercise. We got a few of them in the church, and that's all right. But it's work for me. <laughs> you know, I, I don't love it. But for the psalmist, he loves it. He loves the word of God. In the Old Testament, God's will was largely a matter of the law. In the New Testament, it's always a matter of love. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's obedience. You know, I can tell people when they say, oh, I love Jesus. But as we read from James, if there's no evidence of faith in how they live, how they behave, how they obey God's word, they don't really love Jesus. The loving and the keeping of the word of God are welded together in Christ Jesus. He goes on. He says, I love them greatly. But there's another reason. When you look at verse 168, I obey your precepts and your statutes for all my ways are known to you. All my ways are known to you. The psalmist knows that all his ways are seen by God. Now his first motive for keeping God's word was from the heart. His second one is more from the head. It simply made good sense to him to keep God's word because he knew that God was always watching him. All my ways, all of them. You can go to Psalm, what is it, 139? God knows when you get up in the morning and when you go to bed. He knows when you go out and when you come home. He pulls up his seat to your table at mealtime. He's the unseen guest at every meal, the silent listener to every conversation is that catchphrase. He rides with you in the car and he knows your thoughts and knows the intent of your heart. God is omniscient and God is omnipotent. He's omnipresent. So doesn't it make good sense to fear God and keep his commandments? I know when I was a child, the pastor that I grew up under stressed that point more than anything else about living in obedience to God is because God sees you everywhere you go. He knows everything you do. The psalmist says, because that's the greatness of the God that I know, I'm going to obey him. And of course, the implication was, if Jesus comes again, you don't be caught doing some of those things that you're doing. Well, that's true. But it's more than that. I don't, I don't want to be caught I want to be consistent in living in obedient, obedience to God's word. So what's your response to God and his word today? Does your heart respond to God's word with fear and trembling? 
and that fear and trembling, does that result in complete obedience to the word of God? Do you have that desire to be complete in your obedience to him? Do you see the connection between the fearing, the fearing of God and the keeping of his commandments, especially with experiencing the riches of God's revelation? You say, well, pastor, I, I don't experience peace. Or, you know, I have trouble praising God. But what about fearing God and keeping his commandments? Can you proclaim your obedience like the psalmist here to God? Proclaim, his, proclaim your obedience to God and his word today. And that's a proclamation that is really unconditional and complete. He says, I will obey or I obey. Is that your desire this morning? You see, that's what it comes down to. One of the things that we've learned in Sunday school the past two weeks, this morning and the week before, that was what the apostles said when they stood before the religious leaders that were persecuting them was we have to obey God. We have to obey God rather than men. That's the decision you have to make today. No matter what. With my whole being. I'm going to fear God. And tremble at his words. Because it is the word of God. It's his word to you. Not for you to debate, not for you to question, not for you to see it as some kind of sticker on a car that's optional. You know, look at these optional things. No, it's God's word. And our response needs to be like the psalmist. I tremble at your word. And I have to, I know I've got to quit. If I don't, Mike's going to put a trap door under the pulpit one of these weeks, and I'm going to fall through. But it's, it's one of the reasons why preaching is such a hard thing. Because when I prepare, I have to tremble at God's word. And it's not a light thing. It's not a small thing to stand before you or any other group and say, thus saith the Lord. Because your response ought to be to God's word, fear and trembling. And without that, you never experience the kaleidoscope of the riches of God's revelation. Let's pray. Father, I have to confess that we get so caught up in the routine of doing church. We get caught up in the routine of the business of Christianity. Though we neglect, we neglect your word, but we neglect to treat you with the respect and the awe and the fear that you deserve. You're a holy God. One of the words that is printed on the Bible is a holy Bible. And so I ask for each one of us here this morning that you would renew us 
and give us that sense of fear and trembling in coming into your presence, in reading and hearing your word, And may your word, as you've promised, not return empty, but as it has been sent forth this morning, may it accomplish all that you have it intended for it to accomplish in each of our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's sing a song in response. Shall we stand? Number 82 is...